this time on Psychic Investigators. In Maryland, a promising young Harvard grad vanishes. This 23-year-old woman had just disappeared. Everyone fears the worst. We have a pillowcase that came from our house, stained in blood. And right away, you know that something bad has happened here. Then, a psychic's cryptic visions open the door. The person that I envisioned absolutely hated Laura. To a world of insanity and terror. It is the strangest, most bizarre case that I have ever worked on. Bethesda, Maryland, an affluent suburb just minutes from Washington, D.C. Home to movers and shakers, professionals and politicians. Home to 23-year-old Harvard graduate Laura Hotling, who's just moved back in with her mother and landed a job at a PR firm. But on the morning of October 19, 1992, Laura doesn't show up at work. Her co-workers call, no reply. One of them is a good friend, Concerned, she phones Laura's brother. Laura was extremely responsible, and she was very considerate, so she would have called, and I was quite sure of that. I knew something was strange. Warren Hotling, a teacher, heads over to his mother's house to check. His sister isn't home. By nightfall, there's still no sign of Laura. Increasingly worried, he calls the police. Sergeant Rich Fallon was on duty that night. The police took the report, and nothing was done for at least a day. You give them 24, 48 hours to show back up, then after that, you start getting concerned. Their mother, Penny Hotling, is away at a conference. When Warren calls her, she cuts her trip short and returns home. Because the police weren't able to do anything, we wanted to do something. We were convinced that there was something going on, there was something wrong. And so a, a lot of Laura's friends got real active. They put together a poster. It was very important to us to try to get, you know, information out there so we could find something out. Laura Hotling's disappearance is big news in Bethesda. In the upper crust homes, a crime or a missing person is rare, especially in a family like the Hotlings, where you have a, a daughter who went to Harvard, the mother is a psych psychotherapist. Crimes like that just don't happen in those kind of families. Adrian Havel writes about the story. Laura was virtually the all-American girl. She had everything going for her. She was very accomplished, a fantastic student. She was six feet tall, very long-limbed, and she had a really sweet smile. After two days, there's still no word from Laura. The police launch a full-scale investigation, starting at her home. It was nothing suspicious, nothing unusual, nothing disturbed in the house. Didn't appear to be any break-in. The police canvass the neighborhood. Curiously, a neighbor's nanny tells them she saw the tall, slim blonde leaving for work at 8 a.m. She said every day, Laura comes out of the house and waves to the children and her. And this day before, Laura had walked out of the house. She was wearing a trench coat, and slacks, and uh, nothing seemed unusual except for the fact that she didn't wave. If Laura left home at 8 that morning, where is she now? It really was baffling because this 23-year-old woman had just disappeared. Harry Gearing handled the press for the Montgomery County Police. You have to keep your mind wide open to any possibility. Did she have a boyfriend? Did she have some reason to run away? Was she running away from something? So you have to ask some difficult questions. It was very, very uncomfortable to not know what was going on. Part of you says, don't make things up. All we know right now is we don't know where she is. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. But I didn't have any kind of explanation. And so that was, was frightening. Police interview friends and family. They search local fields and woods. Then, four days after Laura's disappearance, a discovery that throws the investigation in a whole new direction. Half a mile from Laura's house, cadaver dogs uncover a bloody pillowcase. The blood-stained pillowcase was not 
the, just your average kind. This was a high dollar pillowcase. The normal person wouldn't have this in their house. The police match the pillowcase to the linens at the Hodling home and send it to forensics. This is still a missing person case, officially, because you still don't have concrete evidence to suggest that there's been uh, a murder. But when you have bloody evidence, it really is very strongly suggesting foul play. That was kind of a confirmation for me that something, that something bad had happened, which I already felt pretty strongly was the case at the time. In fact, I remember it was a point of conflict with the police about what kind of investigation it was, whether it was a missing persons investigation or a homicide investigation. The Bethesda community at first was more puzzled than fearful. But when reports began to show up on television about not only Laura being missing, but police crews finding blood, then they began to get worried. Four days after she vanished, the blood-drenched pillowcase suggests something terrible has happened to Laura Hotling. But what? A local psychic, famous for locating the missing, claims she can help. This psychic was known to the police because she helped us out in a previous case. I think it was in 1991. We had a police dog go on missing. And with the psychic's help, the officers were able to recover that dog. So when she approached us with the information about the Laura Hodling case, I think the officers were willing to listen. The picture I was seeing was of a woman, but her energy was very masculine. The person that I envisioned was very jealous of Laura, very jealous. A week after 23-year-old Laura Hotling vanishes from her Maryland home, police have no idea whether she's alive or dead. A psychic offers to help. Deborah Heinecker claims to read energy from photographs and personal objects to help locate the missing. I call it tuning in, and I basically remove everything from my mind, make my mind a blank slate, and then I focus on whatever it is. A police officer agrees to meet with a psychic to discuss the case. While holding the missing persons poster, the psychic sees a puzzling image. I got a vision of someone in my mind it was a woman, but it was very strange to me because she had a male energy, and the male energy was very strong, and I found that very confusing. The person absolutely hated Laura, and actually, this person was very jealous of Laura, very jealous. I had visions of the person wrapping Laura in what looked to me to be a sheet or a comforter, and I felt that the person changed into Laura's clothes and carried her out. At that point, I felt relatively sure that Laura was no longer alive. A woman with a man's energy, intense jealousy, and murder. Detectives agree Laura might be dead, but they're mystified by the psychic's strange visions Basically, what is that? What, what's a woman with a man's energy? And it really didn't fit in because we didn't believe it was a woman that did this. We believe it was a man that did this. As the investigation gathers speed, lab testing confirms that it's Laura's blood on the pillowcase recovered in the woods. That would indicate that something must have happened in the bedroom. So we then went into Laura's house and we stripped down the bed. And her mother mentioned that these sheets that are on the bed don't belong on this bed. These are for the guest bedroom. And there was no mattress pad. And we examined that mattress, and there was no sign of blood. Police opt to use a new chemical to look for blood. Luminol reacts with the hemoglobin in the blood, and it becomes luminescent. They sprayed it, turned out the lights, and that mattress glowed. And it was like the 4th of July, all of this blood suddenly appeared, and we couldn't see it because the suspect had cleaned it up. The police are now almost certain that Laura is dead, just as the psychic predicted. 
What was told to us was that there was blood on the mattress and there was enough blood that a person could not have survived losing that much blood. So that was a confirmation that she was dead. In all likelihood, Laura did not leave her home alive. The idea that she had come out the next morning and was walking down the street did not match at all. The neighbor's nanny who said she saw Laura leave at 8 a.m. the morning of her disappearance was clearly mistaken. But if it wasn't Laura, who was it? You have a prominent young woman uh, murdered in her home, so presumably there's a killer running loose. So there's, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to find out who did it and catch him. The police look again at everyone who might have seen Laura. I talked to the mother, asking her about who hangs around here, who are her friends. And Laura Hodling's mother said, well, we can check with Haddon Clark. Haddon Clark is the family gardener, a homeless man roughing it in the woods outside Bethesda. Laura's mother hired Haddon through a church rehab program and wants the police to leave him alone. She said he has psychological problems. I'm sure it's not him. He is not a violent person. And I would prefer that you not even think of him as a suspect. Back at the station, Fallon briefs his superiors. The name Haddon Clark has a surprising effect on his captain. And he immediately just said, oh my god. Haddon Clark has a dark and twisted past. He's a paranoid schizophrenic with a string of disturbing arrests, including malicious destruction of property and theft. Worse, he was a suspect in the still unsolved disappearance of a little girl in Silver Spring, Maryland. We brought in and talked to detectives that had interviewed him years before, and they told us, hey, look, you know, this guy is strange. I mean, he is odd, and he's very capable of doing this. With the gardener now their number one suspect, police start following Haddon Clark, but they can't arrest him they don't have enough evidence to tie him to Laura's disappearance. There was a point at which the police were suspicious of Haddon, and we were resistant to that, actually. We thought, oh, it can be Haddon. He's harmless. And we caught uh, holy hell over it. Laura Hodling's mother was furious that we were focusing in on him. It's not fair. He's a very gentle person. The minister at the church was furious and said, leave this man alone. Homeless advocates were calling the police department and, and raising hell that we were looking at this homeless man. But then, more lab testing on the pillowcase reveals something highly incriminating, an impression of Haddon Clark's thumbprint in Laura Hodling's blood. And uh, our lieutenant at that time said, notify patrol throughout the county. We want this guy to find him. With this new evidence, the police arrest the gardener on suspicion of murdering the Ivy League grad. We trusted Hatton, and we found out that that trust was misplaced, and that was very difficult. But the question remains, where is Laura? 23-year-old Harvard grad Laura Hotling is set for a Washington law career when she disappears under suspicious circumstances. The family gardener, Haddon Clark, has been charged with her murder but says nothing. We have a bloody fingerprint and no body. And it's basically a circumstantial case. So there's people saying, you don't have enough to get a conviction and we need to release him. At the bond hearing, prosecutors argue to keep Haddon Clark behind bars while they gather more evidence. For me, what was wrong was that I didn't know what had happened to her and arresting him didn't answer the question. There was what people thought had happened, but we didn't know where she was. The police ramp up their search. Montgomery County homicide detectives have drained ponds. They have dug into the earth. They have listened to psychics. They have done so, of course, to find Laura Hodling's body. Kate but Carr. nothing. Months go by. Haddon Clark's in custody, but still not talking. To me, it was a paralyzing experience. I felt very helpless. I knew the police were doing what they could do, and you were just kind of waiting. We knew in our hearts that Haddon Clark had murdered Laura. Proving it was going to be hard. We traveled up to Block Island. We went to Rhode Island. We went all over the place, anywhere he had been. And 
we were having a very, very hard time getting the evidence that we needed to close this case. And it was very difficult. Police are at a dead end. But psychic Deborah Heinecker thinks she knows exactly where Laura is buried. I felt it was relatively close to the campsite. And she was in a shallow grave in mucky, sort of um, peaty soil. Her nose was partially exposed and maybe parts of her cheek and maybe a little of her forehead. But the police aren't buying it. They've already searched around Haddon Clark's makeshift campsite repeatedly. You're always going to have skeptics in the police. We're skeptical by nature. And the Montgomery County Police had searched that area over and over again, and they didn't believe that the body was there. But Deborah insisted to the police that they keep looking. On June 13, 1993, eight months after Laura vanished, a startling turn of events. Right the day before trial, the scientist has to review all of her findings. She looked at the hairbrush that had belonged to Laura Hodling and saw something odd and took off a strand of what she thought was hair that just didn't look quite like the others and examined it, and it was a hair or fiber, as you might say, off a wig. This lone fiber may be the final piece of the puzzle. An earlier search turned up a bizarre storage locker rented by Haddon Clark. We went in, and it was stacked with plastic containers. There were high heels. It was ladies' underwear, ladies' dresses. There were wigs. Just the place was full of female clothing. Then we realized that Haddon was a cross-dresser. Deborah Heinecker's vision begins to make sense. I had the light bulb moment and said, oh, yes, that's what I had to have been feeling when I envisioned this person, but with a male energy. The crime lab makes a positive match. Faced with the damning evidence that puts him at the murder scene, Haddon Clark confesses. In a dramatic twist, the next day the gardener agrees to lead police to Laura's body in exchange for a plea bargain. He takes them to the wooded area surrounding his camp near Bethesda. There, they make a grim discovery. Buried in a shallow grave, they find the remains of Laura Hotling. It had been several months. The rains had washed up part of her body so that part of her body was now exposed and out of the ground. It's just as the psychic had insisted all along. Deborah's description of the grave site was very close to what it was. I mean, it was excellent. Some of the police officers were surprised when Laura's body was found in that location because we thought we did a thorough search. We didn't see anybody there. So it's a mystery to me. Being able to say I know something about where she is was very helpful for us in terms of having some chance at some kind of a closure and, and not just not knowing. The not knowing was very hard. The man who killed Warren's sister had a troubled past. Haddon Clark had a terrible childhood. His mother dressed him in women's clothes, or little girls' clothes, I should say, from the time he could walk. We later learned that he liked to kill small animals. He would shoot cats, kill dogs, put them on the neighborhood's doorstep if the neighbor crossed him. This is the kind of person he is. Little did Laura's mother know that the man she hired to help in her garden was a born killer. But why Laura? Penny Hodling may have treated Haddon Clark, her gardener, her handyman, a lot like a son who came around and did odd jobs. Haddon had become attached to Mrs. Hodling, thinking that, you know, she was like a mother figure. What came up is that Laura had just recently returned from Harvard and had moved into the house. He began to think of Laura as usurping him in the household. She was replacing him. Haddon may have thought Penny Hodling was his mother, but she wasn't. He was really, when it came down to it, the gardener and the handyman. And a rage did build up inside him, I believe. With Haddon's confession, 
a full picture of a savage crime is finally revealed. In the early morning hours of October 19th, Haddon Clark let himself into the Hotling house. Wearing a blonde wig, he entered Laura's bedroom and woke her up. She must have been in total terror when she saw him there, especially since he was wearing a wig. Clark then bound her limbs with duct tape and suffocated her on the bed. He slashed her throat, rolled her up in the bloody bed sheets, and then stashed her body in his truck. Then he came back to the house, cleaned up, replaced the sheets, made it look as normal as he could. Haddon Clark then climbed into the bed, his transformation complete. The next morning, he put on the wig and used her hairbrush to brush his hair, where we got the fiber from the wig. At 8 AM, he left the house with Laura's briefcase, dressed as a woman and wearing a wig. That's who the neighbor's nanny saw leaving. Later that same night, Haddon Clark buried Laura Hodling across the highway from his campsite. For me, sadness was the predominant emotion at the time. And disbelief, murder doesn't happen to people that I know, doesn't happen to people I care about. And life isn't supposed to be this way. That was all changed for me. With his plea of guilty to second degree murder accepted. Haddon Clark was sentenced to 30 years in prison for the murder of Laura Hodling. He later leads police to the remains of Michelle Dorr, the little girl he was suspected of murdering. He claims to have killed others whose bodies have never been recovered. But the police have recovered Haddon's stash of trophies, including Laura Hotling's high school ring. It is the strangest, most bizarre murder case that I have ever worked on. The psychic in this case helped us out, so I'm open to using psychics. If she can help me, I'm very glad to take her help to help me close cases. I don't think I fully appreciated the impact Laura had on other people's lives until she died. For her memorial service, it was a spectacular group of people, and they really, really loved my sister. And I was very touched by that. She's a beautiful person, and I miss her. I miss her.